You can see why Ephesians might be more appealing. <laughs> so to begin this way, I think the Bible stories uh, often are challenging, but they're most often important. So things like this, from Mary, the mother of Jesus, one lesson we learn is to trust, right? From John the baptizer, we learn about the need for repentance and the power of our baptism. From Jesus, we learn about the depth and breadth of God's loving grace, of God's gift of life, of the lasting promise, right? From the prophets, we learn about God's deep concern for justice and truth. But I think we also can learn some important things from other characters in the Bible, from kings to paupers. We learn things that can speak to us in our own day. So to set up the sermon this morning, do you know that the Bible talks about 250 kings and a couple of queens? That it talks about 41 treaties between nations? That it has 73 Bible verses that talk directly to rulers about their behavior and their misbehavior? So, sounds a little political to me, but it could be that in those stories, there's a living word of hope for us this day. So, telling you that, I think it will be helpful this morning to talk about one particular character to see where his kind of behavior and misbehavior leads, okay? So I'm gonna give you his backstory well researched, it may sound somewhat familiar to you. So, this character comes to power through foreign influence and the backroom efforts that get him into high office. In office, he proves to be deceitful and untrustworthy and often cunning. His supporters identify with him closely. They're zealous, even fanatical in their support. And from them, he demands absolute loyalty. And they give it. And then while in office, he threatens and he acts to repress any dissent or criticism. He marries, divorces, remarries. Somehow sexual faithfulness is not one of his better attributes. He fights over border issues with a neighboring country and one of his few accomplishments is the partial rebuilding of a famous wall. He will be accused and tried for betraying his office, for his attempts to stay in power, and for acting as if he is above the law. In today's lesson, he even does a version of that standing on the corner and shooting someone, fully assuming he will not lose any support or even be held accountable for his actions. Which brings us to this morning's gospel from Mark 6. The man I've been describing to you based on historical information is Herod Antipas, yeah? Ruler over the Jewish territory in which John and Jesus were raised. Herod was Rome's man in Jerusalem, right? Maybe you were thinking of someone else. Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great had been ruler when Jesus was born. We have some stories about that. Herod, the line of Herod's whole family is filled with corruption, driven solely by a desire for wealth and power. And Herod Antipas has been described by historians as deceitful, ruthless, untrustworthy, and cunning all out of a fear of losing his position and losing the support of a group of politically driven conservative Jews who took on the name Herodians in his honor. Mark's lesson this morning centers on one especially foolish and cruel act of Herod, and that's the killing of John the baptizer. Both Matthew and Mark tell this story of Herod throwing a party for his birthday, kind of a drunken guy's party, right? And in that party, he calls for his young niece, Salome, to come and dance for the boys, right? As his buddy's entertainment. The lesson says 
Salome's mother Herodias is as driven for power as is Herod. And so she insists that her daughter Salome, all of maybe 12 or 13, go and dance for these men. Now, the story says Salome's dancing gets the men all excited, Herod especially. Some say it might have been just an innocent child's dance, but most scholars sort of lean into the images of erotic and seductive. The payoff of Salome's tease is that Herod offers, offers her the moon, <laughs> half of his kingdom. Salome's mother Herodias sees this as her chance to get rid of John the baptizer. John has been publicly accusing her of incest and attacking her marriage to her brother-in-law Herod. John calls them both immoral and illegal. Herodias is upset enough to kill him. Herod fears, approach, uh, fears appearing foolish by breaking this oath that he's given in front of all of his friends and it's clear he fears the anger of his wife Herodias. So reluctantly, he agrees to have John the baptizer executed, right? So within moments, um, John's head is brought as a gift for little Salome, who hands it to her mom on a platter. Herod has been drawn to John, but he's failed to protect, uh, protect John in the end. Somehow, fear has won out over favor, right? The Bible story says Herod acts with impunity in killing John, believing that he has, as, as tetrarch, immunity from all of his actions. Matthew and Mark say that at John's death, it's then that Jesus begins his public ministry in earnest. And they make it clear that at that point, Jesus does so knowing what his future may well be as well. And true to form, Herod Antipas will be there to sign off on the death of Jesus as well. So here's some of the lessons I think we learn from Herod's reign. It becomes clear to Jesus, and I think to us, that the fate of truth tellers in scripture seldom gains the support of those in power. And that again and again in Bible stories, that desire for power, that fear of losing that power, strives to defeat just about every faithful witness. For John the baptizer and for Jesus, and eventually for those 12 disciples of Jesus, faith and trust in God will overrule their fear. And such faith and trust in God promises to overrule our fears as well, right? Which then brings us the story to us and to our response. While I was describing Herod according to the historians, I suspect you were thinking more like me of a more modern example of that man, right? History has this way of, if not repeating itself, at least repeating similarities. And I think it's disappointing how many Herodians there still are, followers who promise their undying allegiance to a leader also described as deceitful, ruthless, and untrustworthy. As followers of Jesus, who invites and even demands our loyalty alone, we ought not to be found among the Herodians of our day. Neither fear nor a desire for power should overcome our faith or overwhelm our faithfulness. Fear must not stop us in serving both God and neighbor, no matter the cost. So, these are some lessons that I hear. According to the Bible's witness, you and I as followers of Jesus are not to dominate, but serve, not ever seek retribution, but always reconciliation, not ever to lean into revenge, but into restoration, not ever to chase power, but embrace the call to serve as needed, where it's needed, and whoever needs our help, right? We are never to build our life or witness based on lies, but only on truth, God's truth. I also believe 
that Mark's lesson about Herod and John and Jesus serves for us as a warning. It may be possible soon that we will find ourselves living under a new type of Herod, right? If that happens, it's been promised that heads will roll once more, and that it'll happen under an unaccountable for his actions leader, and that once again, loyalists will leap to reap the reward for their misguided support. And that those faithful to Jesus Christ faithful to the gospel of welcome and inclusion and compassion for all, will be silenced and even imprisoned, the threats go. If that comes true, if both decency and democracy die away, well, then you and I are called to double our witness, double our service, doing what Jesus did after John's death. This is what Jesus did carry out public ministry and witness in earnest, fully and faithfully aware of what the future may be. For us, carry out our ministry and our witness in earnest, fully aware, faithfully aware of what that future for us might also be. Mark's gospel makes clear these things. Fear drives the corrupt and power hungry. Faith, trust in God's goodness and mercy and strength and love, power drives the truth-telling servants of Jesus Christ. As disciples of Jesus Christ, God grant that we will be up for such a challenge and that we'll be willing to be in it for the long haul for the sake of the whole world. The Bible is clear. Herod's come and go down to dust having lived only for themselves. Disciples of Jesus Christ, come and stay, work and pray to serve and support the gospel truth no matter what comes our way. That peace and mercy of God that passes our understanding, keep your hearts and your lives deep in Jesus Christ. Amen.